Morning, everybody. Do you guys know it is the middle of August? This many people during COVID are not supposed to be here, huh? How exciting. Love seeing all of you. It's great. That doesn't mean you can skip next week. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but so glad you're here. If you have a Bible, go to Numbers chapter 20. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, my phone has been receiving some random phone number text asking for, like, polling. Has anybody got, like, random? You know what I'm talking about? Those we, we ignore? Uh, so this morning I thought I would take a poll of you guys. We're going to take a poll. Some of you getting nervous now, like, uh-oh, where's this poll? What, what is this? Where's this going to go? My question Over the past month, have there been circumstances, people, things that have happened any time this past month where you have become very frustrated? Anybody raise your hand if there's been any frustration. Okay, all right. How about this past week? Some of you are like this morning, right now. I get it. Frustration. How are you dealing with that frustration? I I was thinking about there's a lady in the church over the past, I think it's seven months, she has not been able to see her grandbaby. Is that seven months? Yes, seven months. Her her son is in in the armed service, and so they're they're quarantined because of certain ways, and so she has not been able to see her grandbaby. And this is, talk about frustration, huh? Until next week for her. How cool is that, huh? But... um, Frustration. We, we can have, yeah, you can clap for that. I'm so happy for her. I don't know if I'm allowed to share what that exactly is, so I'm just, uh, but frustrations. How, how are you dealing with those frustrations? I know some of you may say, you can check my blood pressure. It'll tell you how I'm dealing with my frustrations. So frustration, some of you are probably not sleeping very well. Some of you get frustrated and you start eating a lot. Some of you get frustrated and you stop eating at all, all right? Different, different ways that we deal with frustration. I, I saw a couple kids this week dealing with their frustration. I thought it was, it was interesting. I want to show them to you. This is not my child, FYI. Grandpa teaching grandson how to play golf. How great. He's doing, oh, oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's another boy I want to, he, he, uh, he misses a putt. Put it in, buddy. You got it. Oh, you are not that. I'm not that. I'm not that. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean, huh? Oh, it's only just begun. <laughs> I've seen some of you on the golf course, you, about the same thing happens. <laughs> Frustration. Do you ever think in our study, I don't know, this is about our third month, fourth month into Moses, and next week's our last week on, on Moses, so if you're one of those people like, I, I can't hear any more about Moses, you got one more week, and we're transitioning, but do you ever think Moses got frustrated? If you've walked in this series with us, All the things that happened with Moses, probably things could have happened, people interaction with him probably took him to a place where he could have easily been very, very frustrated. I told you to go to Numbers 20, but in Psalms 106, if you have your Bible, hold your place in Numbers 20, flip over to Psalms 106, Psalms is right in the middle of the Bible, Psalms 106, there is kind of a synopsis, a walkthrough of the frustrations of the Israelites as they came, as they exited out of slavery. I want to I walk you through that just for a second this morning. So if you have a Bible, a phone, iPad, however you want to go there, Psalms 106, I want to read you a few verses that just talk of the frustration that Moses could have with the Israelites. Let's start in verse 7. Our fathers, when they lived, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love. 
but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his namesake. Skip down to verse 12. Kind of a joyous thing. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. Verse 13, but they, they soon forgot his works. They did not wait on his counsel. Keep reading. Verse 16, and then, then the men of the camp became jealous of Moses and Aaron. And verse 19, then they made a golden calf and they worshiped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land. Keep reading. Verse 24. Then they despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. They murmured in their tents, and they did not obey the voice of the Lord. Last week, Doc spoke at the, the, our 1030 gathering and talked about how the Israelites came right up to the promised land. They sent in 12 spies. The spies came back, and 10 were bad, and 2 were good, and and, and, and God had promised them that, but they didn't believe God. Frustrations of Moses leading them. So then we skip over to verse 32. It says, they angered him at the waters of Meribah, and it went ill with Moses on their account. For they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with his lips. Frustration. This morning I want to talk to you about frustration. I want to show you how Moses dealt with frustration. Because here's what I see in our world. There's lots of frustration out there. Lots of things that are making us so... And if we are followers of Jesus, how do we deal with frustration? I know the wrong ways to deal with frustration. I'm pretty good at those. But looking at Moses and all the frustrating things that happen, how do we deal with this frustration? Let's pray and dive in the word. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning and our church. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing be upon the church. Lord, this morning, teach us your word. Lord, may you speak to our hearts. Lord, that we may not just come and and leave without hearing from you, Lord. But you, you, you touch our hearts that will hear from you to be changed, to be convicted. So move this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So back in Numbers chapter 20, we read a story about Moses and the people of Israel. You may have heard something like this before. Starting in verse 2, it says, Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished with our brothers when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we should die here? The people came to Moses and said, we don't have water. Moses, we would rather die than have you lead us. We, we would have rather died with our family than to be out here where we're at right now. Now, I want you to get the context of this chapter right here, this story, because you may, if you've walked with this, you may think, well, didn't we talk about that story already? Didn't we already talk about the story how they asked for food and God gave them manna and then they asked for water and, and, and God gave them water? Didn't we already? Well, see, this is happening again. Now, with the timeline of Moses, and I think it's important to see it. I, I break Moses down into three 40s. There was the first 40 years of his life where he was he was born an Israelite, but God saved him. He grew up in the Egyptian kingdom having everything the Egyptians had, having all wealth, having all teaching for 40 years. But after that 40 years, the Bible tells us he murders a man and he flees from Egypt with Pharaoh wanting to kill him. The next 40 years of his life, he lives in the desert. Says he, he meets a man who becomes his father in law. He, ha, he has a wife. He has a family. For 40 years, he's a shepherd. Things are good. At the end of that 40 years, God shows up in a burning bush and says, Moses, I got a plan for you. What I want you to do is go back to Egypt and set my people free. 
So we've been studying. Moses goes back to Egypt, sets the people free. God brings the plagues. They go the Red Sea. Then, then through the short period of time, we have the Red Sea. We have where God gives them their relate, like this is what our relationship looks like with the Ten Commandments. God then says, I'm going to dwell with you, gives them the tabernacle. God says, I'm going to be with you. You're my people. This is our relationship. And he leads them right up to the edge of the promised land. And then they don't go in. So then there's the last 40. And really for the next 40 years, the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness just staggered, not going anywhere. See, last week you heard that when they didn't go in, God, God said, everyone over 20 years of age, I'm gonna count, uh, you're going to be accountable for this. And you won't be able to go in the promised land. So for 40 years, when we get to Numbers chapter 20, it is toward the end of that 40 years. So last week's sermon with the people who said, hey, we're not going in, most of those people have passed. They project some 600,000 people have passed, passed away. These are new people. New people that are coming to Moses with the same problem. So as we keep reading, Moses then does what he normally does. Him and Aaron go to the Lord. Verse 6, then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent meeting and fell on their face. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this was the directions. Take the staff, assemble the congregation, you and Aaron and your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. So Moses goes to the Lord, gets the answer. This is what Moses does. Moses is the mediator between God and the people. He then brings the message to the people. But this is where it goes wrong. Verse 10 says, Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we, which is really interesting, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abounding, and the congregation drank in their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land of that I have given them. Frustration. The people that he is leading over and over again. Frustration. And we see how Moses deals with it. This morning I, I, I want to use Moses as an illustration to help us understand how not to deal with frustration. Because it is hurting so many believers we are allowing frustration to take us down paths we should never go. So I want to show you the path of Moses. See, the first thing that happened is first, the frustration took Moses to a place of anger. Now, there may be a little conjecture, and you may go, are you sure Moses was angry? Well, see, when I read, hear now you rebels, I don't think he came to them and was like, hey, rebels. You guys are rebels. I don't think that's what happened. It says he took his staff. See, God said, don't, God said, speak to the rock and the water will come out. God, it says he took the staff and he struck the rock twice. I just, I don't think he went, boop, boop. I just don't think that would happen. Is Moses a human? I think Moses explodes here. I think Moses explodes in anger and goes, hey, have you not seen what God has done? You are rebelling against God. And he takes the staff and takes a swing. Twice. And he fires. He, he becomes angry. 
Now, we have seen Moses angry. When you follow back, that's why I love studying uh, big passages of Scripture, because if you've been walking with you think about Moses, like, oh, yeah, Moses got angry a few times. He murdered that guy, didn't he? It says, when, when Pharaoh said no, it says that he was filled with hot anger, is what the Bible says, to describe this fury that was going on inside of him. A couple, couple weeks ago, remember, they, they built the golden calf. Moses had the Ten Commandments. What did he do with them? Somehow he bounced them off the floor, and he destroyed them. I don't think he went, hey. Anger. Then says he crushed the golden calf, and he made all the people drink it. Anger. There was anger in his life. Now, now I want to tell you, we don't need to look at Moses and go, man, that guy was an angry guy. If I followed you for your 80 years, you want me to find stuff? Right? Anger can take us places. Moses, the frustration took him to anger. Now, there were things going on in his life at this time also. It's very interesting. At the beginning of this chapter, Numbers chapter 20, it says his sister dies. To me, that's very interesting. It says... Right at this time, Miriam, his sister, we, we hear about his sister who helped him when he was born in the basket. We hear about her a couple other times, but right here it just says, Miriam passes away. And maybe that was for, you see a little bit into what's going on in Moses' life. Then this new generation of people are acting like the old generation of people. Right? Right? They're doing the same thing. Water, I want water. God's, suppl- God's still supplying the food. The man- God's still taking care of them, but they're still going, hey, that's not how we want that to happen. And then when he goes to God and God says, they're complaining, okay, here's what I want you to do. Go give them water. Maybe Moses went, God, I don't want you to respond that way. I, I want you to bring water and hail. How about we do that, God? Give them water. They're complaining. They're not trusting. Hey, God, why don't you respond this way? Man, I think to my life, in the frustrating times that happen in my life, and things don't go how I want them to, and people don't react the way that they should, and then God doesn't respond how I want God to respond. That frustration level. And Moses explodes. One of the commentaries I read says it's almost as though he thought it was necessary to do the work of vengeance himself. Thus, thus his hard words, his sarcasm, his blows against the rock. Now some of you may be saying, am I not allowed to be angry? Yes, you are allowed to be angry. The Bible says we can get angry. We see Jesus We see the Lord. There's anger. But let me read you a few verses about anger. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brethren, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So what happens when we're quick to anger? Proverbs 14.29, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Proverbs 16, 32, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. So what is the teaching? There are things that are going to lead us to anger. But the question is now where is the anger taking you? Where is that anger? Is the anger what is ruling you and leading you? Or is that anger under control? Exodus 4, 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Why? Because anger in your life can give opportunity to the devil. You see this? Like when something goes on at work and you come home and your kid does something and you just go, boom! And you go, wait, that response I gave didn't, that, what he did didn't deserve that response. 
what have you done? You've let frustration lead to anger, and now you're letting anger lead you to do things you shouldn't do. You respond to your spouse the wrong way. You're like, man, she says something or does something. You have no grace. You have no any. You just have explosion. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Do I need to make you raise hands? Right? Yes. Or at work. What happens? Church, we get frustrated. And we're going to be frustrated. We live in a broken world. It's going to be frustrating. And it can lead to where we get angry. But where do you allow anger to take you? What is anger doing in your life? See, Moses went from frustrated to being angry. And then look at verse 12. And if you get nothing this morning, if, you, if, if you've checked out maybe, check back in. Just get this verse and you can check back out. Verse 12. Numbers 20, verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. God says, because you did not believe in me to uphold my holiness. Another translation says it this way. Because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy. See, anger took Moses now down a path to a place where he doesn't honor God's holiness. You may ask, what, what do you mean? How, to honor God's holiness. What, is, what, what are you talking about? Another verse in Numbers explains this situation. says, because you rebelled against my word. The instructions were really clear to Moses. Moses, here's what I want you to do. Go to the people. Take the rod, go out to the rock, speak to the rock. One commentary said, then get out of the way. That's not what happened. He came to the people and exploded on the people. Smoked the rock a couple times. Isn't it interesting? God still graciously gave. As he does. He graciously gave. But Moses didn't trust God enough to honor his holiness. Listen, when we choose to go our own way, when we choose to allow anger to take us to a place, we are saying, God, forget your holiness. I'm going my way. God, I know the situation. You say this. And, and I'm speaking to followers of Christ. Like, you say this. You are holy. But I look at your holiness and go, no. I reject your holiness and choose my way. And that is what Moses is called out here. Moses said, because you, or God said, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy. Believing in the Lord, believing in God's holiness, and obeying his word. These two words are so important. This, this believing and obedience, they are wrapped together in our relationship with the Lord. Believing the Lord and obeying the Lord, they are so tied together. If you've been in church a while, you may have heard somebody say, hey, we just want you to accept Christ as Savior. You heard that statement before? But sometimes that can get misleading. Like, like a relationship with Christ is just me going, okay, I accept you. That's great. All right, good. I accepted Christ. Let's move on. And we think that's the relationship with the Lord. And, and I've seen so many people, they walk through life going, I accepted Christ, but they have nothing to do with Christ. And they have this fake thing. And sadly, many of them go, oh yeah, I got, I'm gonna, I got Jesus. When, when that's not what salvation is. See, we want you to believe in Christ to have him to be the head of your life, to have him be your savior. And when you do this, this thing of obedience wraps into it. Why? Because you look on God's holiness. You look on his goodness. You know he loves you and wants the best for you. And it's wrapped together. Now, I'm not saying that we are saved by works. Nope. It is all Jesus. 
Jesus who, who saves us. He died on the cross because of who he is. And maybe there's somebody in here this morning that has never believed in Jesus Christ, accepted him as Lord and Savior to lead his life, to change your life. And accept Christ, believe in Christ, make him the Lord of your life so it changed your life to obey Christ this morning. Works doesn't save you. You can't be good enough to get saved. None of us can. But what happens is, when we believe in him and his holiness and goodness, this obedience wraps around it. We're not perfect, but it leads us to change our lives. Now Moses, I'm, I'm not saying Moses didn't know the Lord, but I am saying at this point in life he went, God, I'm not going to believe in your holiness and your way. And he let anger, he let frustration lead to anger, and anger took him down a path where he didn't honor God's holiness. And then one more place. Maybe, maybe the saddest place. See, it took Moses to a place where he misrepresented God. See, Moses was the mediator. He would go to God and he would give the word to the people. But Moses rep misrepresented God here. You ever turn on the TV maybe Saturday or Sunday and you go to one of the main channels and they got an infomercial on? And right before the infomercial starts, there's this like blip that comes up that says, uh, the NBC channel has no affiliation with this product. And we, you know, like... Um, uh, that it, it, it doesn't stand by any of the associates. We do not back this. We do not represent this. This is just totally on its own. They're just paying us money. We got nothing to do. It's, we don't represent this product. Have you seen that? In our culture today, we see, uh, just kind of loud, I think, because of social media, you see people get, get fired or let go of companies because they say something or did something 28 years ago or something comes up and they'll let that person go and say, this person did not represent our company. Like what they did doesn't represent, so we're letting them go. We've seen that a lot. But that's becoming very difficult in our world because what represents us, right? Company, what represents them? What? But here's what we do know. If we follow Jesus we know who we're supposed to represent. We, we know what that is. We're called to represent the Lord. I, I am called as a pastor to represent the Lord. And I hope to do that. Like, this is not a Sunday thing. This is an everyday thing. When you see me, to represent the Lord. But I'm also called to represent the Lord to my wife and how I act when, when you don't even see. I'm called to represent Christ to her. And then my boy, he needs to see Christ in me. See, in 2 Corinthians 5, it says we are called to be ambassadors. That we are called to represent the Lord. And when we let frustration lead to anger, and anger leads us to choose our own way, it leads us down a path where we go, I'm a Christian, and we misrepresent God. And we allow posts, and we allow arguments, and we allow things at work because of frustration to move us away from God's plan. We can't do that, church. Moses, he was frustrated, led to anger, anger where he dishonored God's holiness. Took him to a place where he misrepresented God. Warren Worsby says this. Difficulties either bring out the best in people or the worst. They either mature us or make us more childish. So here's my challenge for you. If you do know the Lord, how are you dealing with frustration? The Lord who gives you strength, the Lord who is there, the Lord who loves you and guides you and protects you. Are you leaning on him? How about the person you're angry with wherever it's at? At work, in the government, wherever it's at, that frustration. Are you praying more for them or hating them more? Ooh, got quiet. 
Is it leading you to pray more for them and and to to care and to love? Or is it leading you to a place to go, you know what? I don't really care what happens to them. It shows what frustration is doing to us. See, God calls us to have a spirit, that Holy Spirit that leads us to love and to joy and to peace and to patience and to kindness and to goodness and to self-control. He gives us the strength to do that. James 1.2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, if any of you struggle with this, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Just wanted to challenge us all this morning. As the frustration level is high, if we know Jesus, may we be people who are filled with that love. Who when anger comes, we don't let it rule our life. We let the Holy Spirit rule our life. When we see people, we see people how Christ sees them. We love people how Christ loved them. We represent the true church. Why? Because we have a Savior. Moses saw the grace of God over and over and over poured out on the Israelites who kept messing up. I have seen the grace of God poured out in my life over and over and over. Anybody else with me? I've seen that grace poured out because of the loving God. He is good. He is holy. And may my belief in him lead to obedience in him that people may see Christ in me, may see Christ in you, and may see a church that represents the King of Kings. Will you stand with me, please? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, may we worship you. Lord God, as we struggle with the frustrations, Lord, may you give us the wisdom and the strength to be what you want us to be. Continue to grow us, Lord. Pray for those in you who don't know those in here who don't know you as Savior, Lord, this morning. May they believe on you. To trust you died on the cross and rose again. Lord, we praise you. Thank you. You are good in Jesus' name. Amen.